Hey brothers and sisters, uh, this is Francis Enneros just bringing a word today. Um, I dreamt a little bit last night and uh, you know like always I was praying um, here before I got started, uh, picked up my Bible. I asked, I was praying for a long time actually. You know today was a weird day, uh, I'm going to throw this out there. Did anybody notice anything unusual about today? Uh, normally when I'm praying my car, the cabin, is filled with the Holy Spirit. Just filled with the Holy Spirit. The Shekinah glory of the Holy Spirit is just manifest. I'm in it. I feel it. It's all around me. It's great. It's awesome. I love it. Uh, and today, I didn't feel it. I didn't feel it. I'm not saying he wasn't there because he's always there. But I didn't feel it. And I noticed this morning when I first woke up, normally I get up, I'll get some coffee, get my Bible open, and I'll start praying, uh, you know, just kind of meditating and praying and stuff. And uh, I didn't feel it then either. And I thought that was kind of odd. That was unusual. I wasn't like, I wasn't entering in. I wasn't getting it. Everything was kind of fractured. And then, um, then I opened my computer and I was working on, you know, uh, I was working on putting some thoughts together about today which, you know, I don't normally do. Normally I just speak out of my heart. But today God had, it felt, I felt this morning like I was supposed to talk about a, a specific thing. And I wanted to gather my thoughts together before I did it. Uh, so I was, I was just, you know, put, putting it down. And, um, and then when I got here, uh, you know, to the gym and I, and I pray in the parking lot, I, uh, I, you know, I just, I just felt space and it wasn't I don't know it was just a little different I was just wondering if anybody felt it uh, so then I picked up my Bible and I asked the Lord to show me something I had a dream last night and uh, the dream was uh, a warning confirmation and I, I asked God to show me in his word today and he did <laughs> I, sh I I opened up to Micah 1. And I, I don't want to read it. I don't want to read it. If, if you want to read it, you can. But it confirmed what my dream was. And I'm not even going to tell the dream. Some of you know, if you know what's going on. Um, I dreamt that... Uh, um, the giraffe... Uh, April had her baby. She had her baby giraffe in my dream last night. So, um, if that means anything to you, then and send me a comment about it. If it doesn't, then no worries. Um, I don't mean to be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Cryptic. But, um, the Lord just doesn't want me to share any more than that. If you know, what I'm talking about, great. If you don't, no big deal. Today I'm um, I'm going to be talking more about authority. Uh, I talked about this a couple of uh, a couple of uh, maybe two weeks ago, and God just really wants you to know who you are and whose you are, and what is available for you. You know, um, when he created Adam, he gave Adam dominion over the earth. And then um, Adam was deceived and sinned, and dominion was given to Satan. Satan ruled the earth. Uh, he had the legal right over it until Jesus came, and he took it back. I've been spending a lot of time on authority. I, I've meditated on a lot, and uh, most of the time... What I realize is that when people should be commanding and demanding and taking authority over things, they passively pray about it, asking the Father to do that which He gave us. And you! Sorry. <laughs> he gave us the right to do. Um, it's our job. It's a job. You know, I say it all the time. It's like if I hire an instructor to run my business and he's calling me up asking me, whining, complaining about this and that. You know, my response is going to be, that's your authority. You know, that's your job. That's what I hired you for. Well, certain things 
are in our power. God's not going to do them. You know, um, if he's given us the responsibility, he's not going to undermine us by coming in underneath us and doing it for us. He's not going to do that. Holy Spirit's a gentleman. So, what if the reason that people aren't seeing the breakthrough in their trial, the sickness, or whatever situation is in their life, is because God is waiting for them to assume the authority that he's already given to them. You know, if you think about it like this, we as believers, we're, we're the perennial, perennial authority here on earth. You know, as in uh, Exodus with Moses, God needed Moses. He used Moses to carry out his plan, you know, on earth as it is in heaven. You know, there's a great verse in the Bible. I love this. It says, the eyes of God go to and fro across the earth looking for somebody that he can use himself strong in. And I remember the first time I saw that, it was the first time, I, I, I tell you all how, sometimes I'll read the Bible and the word will come off the page in 3D at me. That was the first time that happened. When I saw that, that thing came off the page at me in 3D. And I remember thinking to myself, I want to be that person. And then I said it out loud, Lord, I want to be that person. I want to be the person that, that you find that you say, ah, Jesus, there's somebody we can use. Let's use him. I wanted to be that person. So, have you ever wondered why bad things happen to to you know to Christians to good people? You know, it's always it's the, that saying is bad things always happen to good people. You know why they're why they're they're sick or why they're hurt or why you know they're just they go from trial to trial. You know, sometimes when I'm praying for people, I, I see in their heart that. Um, that they've been hurt by the church or or maybe somebody they loved got sick and they prayed 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 and that person died anyways and they don't understand it because they don't understand authority you know 2 Corinthians 10 uh, 4 and 5 says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty uh, in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Yeshua. So, we have to get to the point where we understand we are at war. This is war, y'all. And the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not from this earth. They're, this battle, this way of battle, it is that we wage can't be waged outside the Word of God. Now, a stronghold is, is a place of bondage uh, where God's Word is being undermined. Um, and it's, it's undermined by our worldly beliefs, by, by something that, that we hold is true in the world, but it's contrary to what God's Word says. Now these strongholds, what Satan does is he first establishes the stronghold in our mind with a lie from the enemy, like um, a good one would be this. Cancer runs in our family. And eventually everyone in our family dies from cancer. You know, I, I know in my wife's family, uh, she had seven uncles, and every single one of them died of lung cancer, and her mom died of lung cancer. Okay? Every one of them, except for one. You know, these people, they walk around, and they start saying this, and they start repeating it, and then they start to believe it. And, and then once the thought's been placed, the enemy will continue to repeat it. And, and then he'll manipulate that person with a demon whispering in their ear, reminding them of the lie day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, for the sole purpose of what? Getting them to say it. It's their confession, y'all. I keep talking about the confession. It's all about the confession. You know, you got to understand that 
the confession is the key. He's got to get us to say it. You know, as soon as they say it, they own it. They accept it. They receive it. You know, I told you my wife's, uh, uh, her mother and her seven uncles all died of lung cancer. Every one of them. Every one of them, except for one. What was the difference of that one? She was a spirit-filled believer that wouldn't say the words. She watched her confession, and she confessed only that which God said over her. The, the, the woman is like 90-something now. She's awesome. She's absolutely awesome, but she broke the curse. The curse was nothing more than a lie that was planted and passed from person to person every time they confessed it. You know, in Mark 11, we, we, we keep talking about it. Mark, I keep talking about Mark 11, 11, 23. Whatever we speak with our mouth and believe in our hearts, these things will come to pass. You know, uh, and, and, and I like to put it like this. Jesus wasn't goofy. He didn't say something and then go back later and go, you know, I really didn't, shouldn't have said it like that. I didn't mean that. And when he said something, he meant exactly what he said. He said, whatever you speak with your mouth, whatever. What does the word whatever mean? anything everything you know i have people coming against me you know you 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 you're you're you're, you're spewing the, the 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 same stuff that the world's saying you know jesus said it i didn't say it you know maddie i didn't say it jesus said whatever you speak with your mouth and believe in your heart these things will come to pass he doesn't say maybe they will they will and satan knows that and i told you before when, when, when the rhema word came to me and he said the power that the devil has is the power we give him by the words that we speak. Because he knows. He, when Satan was cast to earth, he was stripped of the spiritual power of the spoken word. We have it. God gave it to us. He was stripped of it. It was probably devastating for him. He used to have it. He used to be able to walk around in it. The power of the spoken word. The power to create things with your words. He used to have it. He don't have it anymore. We do. He's furious because it was taken away from him and God put it in us, which really puts us in a position of authority over him because by the confession of our words, he really is already a defeated foe. Not only because of what Jesus did on the cross, but that is just so much more and better. But if we just watch the words of our mouth, he'd have no foothold, no stronghold, no authority, no power, no nothing over us at all. I can't stress to you enough how important it is to watch your words. To watch your words. Now we know that the devil can place thoughts in our mind. Clearly, obviously, we know that. That's where these things come from. But the thought has no power until we say it. Like we talked about the other day, where it says, take no thought saying, which I believe was uh, Matthew 6.31. You take the thought when you say the thought. Satan places the thought, and then he repeats it, repeats it, repeats it, repeats it, repeats it, until we say it. Then... This power that was stripped from him, that we have, he then harnesses, all right? He's harnessing a power that is no longer his through us. He ne actually needs us in a way. He needs people to speak things for him because that power has been taken from him. If you get this, you're really going to go a long way today. This is a very, this is a very integral part of today's message. Satan doesn't have power except that which he steals from us. He needs you to speak on his behalf. He needs your power. He steals your power. He plants a thought and he gets you to say it. Now, once we speak the thought, that Satan has been putting, you know, that lie that he's been putting in our head. Once 
once he gets us to say that thing that he's been whispering in our ear, he can then bring his plan into fruition. Okay? He has the legal right. And this is what you, got, you guys got to understand. He has the legal right to do that thing he's been planning. Okay? Because it's almost like a courtroom. You know, Satan stands before God and he's railing against us. And he's using the law. You know, he's probably standing there telling God, you know, your law says this. You know, these are spiritual laws. And they've broken the laws. They've spoken this thing. Now I have the legal right. And God being a righteous God, he's a righteous God. He can't break his own law. He's not going to break his own law. Right? Satan is cunning. He's good at this. He's really good at this. He's like one of those... You know, Jesus is like our public defender. And Satan is like that, that evil defense attorney that is getting his client off who, is, who he knows is guilty of murder. And he's using every trick in the book to do it. And Jesus is like the uh, the district attorney. And then how would it be? I don't know. I, I don't know. But anyway, Satan rails against us. It's like a court scene. And um, because God is righteous and he created these spiritual laws, he, he has to honor them. Um, what the scripture is saying is that when you say it, that is when you take it, and when you take it, it's yours. In the spirit realm, you own it. All right. This is why the scripture commands us to take every thought into captivity. And, and y'all, every is huge. Man, it's huge because we are thinking all day long. It is a barrage of thoughts that are coming in all day. All right? Accompanying... Every lie, every one of these thoughts of the devil is fear. See, with the thought comes fear. Now, fear doesn't have power over us uh, unless we don't understand who we are in Christ and unless we don't know what our promises are, which is, you know, the benefits of God. I keep talking about that. You know, I'm talking about who, learning out your, your identity. When you learn your identity, you know, a lot of my ministry is identity, identity, identity. Know who you are. Know who you are. Know who, what you, who your father is. Know what you have. You're an heir to the throne. You're a child of the Most High God. Walk in the stead of, of, of sonship, right? We're, we're, we're not outside anymore. We're inside. Remember, our father's in heaven. We're ambassadors for Christ. You know, a lot of what I'm teaching is getting you to understand your identity, well, see, if you don't understand your identity, when Satan brings the lie, you're likely to believe it. But if you know who you are in Christ, if you're familiar with your father, if you understand your identity, then when the lie comes in, it's easier to take it into captivity and say, wait a minute, that doesn't line up with what my father says about me. And then you hold it up to the obedience of Yeshua. And, and I keep telling you, you also have to get to that place where you just trust your father. You just trust him. And trust is it's so important. So when fear comes in, a couple of things that shoot down fear are, number one, knowing your identity. Knowing your identity counteracts the fear. Because the fear is going to come in, and then when you remember who you are and whose you are, that it, 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 it kind of holds it off. And then when you remember that your father loves you, and if you trust your father that he's got your best interest at heart, it causes the fear to, to go. Okay? It'll, it'll kind of push it out because a peace will come over you. You know, the Bible says, but in all things through prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your heart and guard your mind in Christ Jesus. All right? When that fear comes in, Whatever it is, you pray about it, and then in that trust, in that believing that now that you've prayed about it, or taken authority over it, whichever it may be, knowing that your Father will back you up. He's always there to back you up. He's not going to leave you alone. There's a great verse, I, and, and I don't remember it word for word, but it's an Old Testament verse, and Paul, um, Paul uh, 
reiterates it in, in the New Testament, and it goes like this. It goes, I will not, I will not, I will not. He says it three times in a row. Now, now when God says, I will not, what does that mean? Well, if he says, I will not, I will not, I will not, what does that mean? It means he won't. <laughs> he, he will, I will not relax my hold on you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. And then there's a couple more, you know, I won't let you down, you know, uh, you know, he's, he's telling him, I'm, I'm there for you. I will not, I will not, I will not. And then he lists all these things that he's going to do for us. And, it, and it's all about being there to protect us, to support us, not to let any harm come to us. And then, and when he's done, he says, assuredly not. I mean, you know, that's kind of cool. I mean, that's a promise. If, if, if you stood on nothing else, if you had no other word, you could stand on that. And whatever you're going through, and Father, you said, you will not, you will not, you will not. Relax your hold on me. You won't give me up. You won't let me down. You won't leave me without support. You know, you're not going to let this happen to me. And then you said, assuredly not. Man, I got to tell you, that's a great word. If you got nothing else out of today's lesson, and you got that, you, you know, you got great word today. You know, I, I told you that when I got saved, uh, as I began to study the word, I realized, I learned very quickly that everything I learned my whole life was wrong. Everything was wrong. Everything I was taught was contrary to the word of God. And then I had to get to a place where I made a decision where God's word was the final authority. If God's word contradicted what I learned, then I had to give up what I learned and adopt what God said about it. And it wasn't the easiest thing in the world. It was, it was kind of difficult. But once you come to that realization, it's the first step. You know, it's like a, a it's like a, 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 a somebody who's an addict that realizes they're addicted <laughs> you know the first step to being cured is realizing you're addicted the first step to changing your thinking is to realize what you're thinking is wrong what you learned was wrong and that the word is right once you come to that realization it's the first step to getting healthy in your mind right you know, when people go to these these um, psychiatrists and 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 you know they're 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 going there because their mind is all messed up and they need they need help. You know that you know, and it's it's weird too because most of the time, uh, it's my experience. I've never actually, I actually well, you know, I went to a marriage counselor when I was really 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 young when my wife and I were going through troubles, and all she did was sit there and listen. She'd ask a question and listen. She never gave any advice. You know, it was, was was weird. It's like you're paying two hundred fifty dollars an hour to hear yourself talk. <laughs> what good is that? How good? What what good does that do you? But we know the word does good. The word is true, and everything else is a lie. So we have to get to that revelation that if it's in God's word and it can be confirmed by another scripture, I have to let go of whatever previous belief that I had. You know, and adopt God's way of thinking then i got to make every effort by the grace of God to begin changing my behavior and doing the things that God's Word says to do. This is walking in the kingdom of God. That's really what the kingdom of God is. It's God's way of doing things. So 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Paul is identifying what can and will take down strongholds. He says, casting down arguments. Now the word arguments is translated imagination okay and we all have an imagination you know when that demon plants the lie in your head it gets you thinking and if you dwell on that thing long enough your imagination will begin to run wild you know let's say you're at work and maybe you do something or say something to somebody 
and and you know maybe you shouldn't have done it or said it whatever it was and then you you know when you're driving home you begin thinking about oh my gosh if this gets back to the boss or maybe you said something in a meeting in front of the boss and you're thinking no oh, you know if he puts two and two together maybe he's going to start thinking that I was doing this or that I was doing that or what supposed to be doing what I was doing or I dropped the ball here or dropped the ball there and then and Satan is over there he's man he's messing with you too he's just messing with you and messing with you mess and he can even get one of your 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 um your co-workers to call you up and and say something about it because he'll be messing with that guy and and oh man I you know I can't believe you said that thing in in, in in the meeting today dude I hope you don't get fired and then you start thinking oh my gosh I can get fired of this and then, and then it starts blowing up and it's going crazy your imagination is running wild and Satan is feeding this thing the whole time he's feeding it from all ends and then you are so, let's say you're tempted maybe to call your boss at home and, and try and rectify the situation or maybe tell a lie or maybe implicate somebody else, you know, which the whole would cause the whole thing to blow up and get you fired. But let's say you get into prayer about it and the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, guard your heart and guard your mind and you just ask God to handle the situation and you go to work the next day and maybe you ask around and there's nothing going on. There's no talk about it. And maybe you poke your head in the boss's office and maybe you say something and he don't even know what you're talking about. He's like, huh? What are you, what are you talking about? Or he just goes, oh, you know, you know, that's nothing. And you realize it was nothing. And you were ready to ruin your entire career over it. See, this is how Satan works. This is what Paul's talking about here when he says, take every thought into captivity these arguments are these imaginations are demonic spirits that are they're feeding on it like a frenzy and they're, they're going to get you riled up and cause you to do and say things that you shouldn't do and you shouldn't say so 2 Corinthians uh, 10 says bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ you know, the Bible says that, that Jesus was tempted in every way as we were. And, and I thought about this one time. I thought about Jesus in the desert. And I wondered if when the Bible says that Jesus was tempted as we are, I wonder if it was not so much that Jesus saw the devil, poof, pop in front of him. He's standing there with his pitchfork and his, and his high heel, goat, goat feet and his horns on his head. Instead, it was just a thought. You're the son of God. His stomach is growling. He's been in the desert for 40 days. He's hungry. His stomach is growling. He looked at a rock. Maybe it was shaped round, kind of brownish, like a loaf of bread, <laughs> you know? And he looked at that, and, and Satan said, Ooh, looks just like a loaf of bread, doesn't it? You're the son of God. You could just turn that thing into a loaf of bread right now. Now, another thing I thought about this was, this is just the way my mind works, is that the Bible says Jesus is the Word, right? So when Jesus says, it is written, Jesus actually could have just said, I have said, because <laughs> he is the Word. It is written, he's quoting the Word, he is the Word, so he could say, I have said. Anyways, I just think like that sometimes. So Jesus quotes the word and, well, the rest is history. So Paul is instructing us to capture our thoughts and we can't capture our thoughts with anything other than the word. That's why it's so important to study the word, to know the word, so that when the thought comes in, the word that, that, the word that contradicts it pops in and then you have the two, you compare the two. You capture the thought and you hold it up to the obedience of Christ. Christ is the word. So we hold, we got the thought, this thought from the devil. It comes in, we capture it. And then we hold it up to what the Word says. And we have to make a determination. What are we going to choose? Well, the Bible says, we shall re we, which report will you believe? We will, re we will believe the report of the Lord. And you go with the Word. All right? So the Word of God will expel the ungodly thoughts. It does. That's what it does. You know, the Word of God will correct corrupt thinking, worldly thinking, or and religious thinking. And don't be de deceived. There's 
as much if not more danger in religious thinking than carnal thinking maybe maybe a lot more you know religious thinking is is thinking that 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 does not line up with what the word of god says religious thinking is you know uh It's like, you know, these people have been hearing this thing their whole life. They've been sitting under this denominational teaching of unbelief so long that to them, it is the Word of God. You know, they hear it so long. It's like, uh, uh, how about this one? No man knows the thoughts of a man except for the spirit that's in him. You know, I've heard that quoted, uh, I don't know how many times. We're, we're, not, we're never going to know God. We're never going to understand because no man knows the thoughts of a man except for the spirit that's in him. But the very next verse says, Now we don't have the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God, that we may freely know all things. And it says, all things. You know, it's just stuff like that. Is You know, they've been sitting under this teaching for so long. They've been hearing this teaching for, for so long incorrectly. They just begin to believe it. You know, they just begin to think that it is the word. You know, you could show people, and, it, and it's religious people are just the hardest too, because you could show them the scripture, you could show them right there, there it is right there, you could show them the very next verse, it's like that verse about the rapture, it says, no man knows the day or the hour, and you could show them the verse before it, you could tell them, look at the verse before it, he's talking about the end of the world, you know, this world will pass away, but my world, my word will never pass away. Of that day, no man knows. What day? The day that the world passes away. You know, and it's like, they keep quoting that verse. You know, that's religious, that's religion. They're just, they're just spewing what they've been taught their whole life. You know, it's like, by gosh, I've been doing it for 50 years, so it must be right. Whether it's right or not, I've been doing it for 50 years, so it must be right. So a religion that says that you must uh, convert so many people to be saved, you got to go knocking on doors, or a rigid religion that says that uh, you must rededicate, you got to go down to the altar and 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 re and um, get resaved every time you sin. Oh man, like you're crucifying Jesus on the cross over and over and over and over again. You know, he says it is finished. What do you think he meant when he said it is finished? It's finished. It's finished. It's finished, y'all. How about a religion that says miracles passed away when the last apostle passed away? A religion that doesn't believe in healing. A re religion that requires us to pray to saints, not Jesus. A religion that says God is punishing you when you sin. But that's not what the Word says. You know, the Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. We are instructed not to have fear. Why? Because what sense does it have? Fear? Does it? What sense does it? It doesn't make any sense to be afraid of something that you're an authority over. You know, it would be like my cat's walking through the, the, the living room, and and my daughter's on the couch going, oh, oh, what's, what's the matter with you? Oh, the cat, the cat, the cat! I'm afraid of the cat. You could step on the cat and squish it. All right, it's a cat. You have more power, more authority than a cat. You know, but it's like that with the word. People are afraid of all these things that they're in authority over. How Satan has deceived man in such a way into thinking that he should be afraid of all this stuff that we are the king of. You know, where these things are under our feet, yet we're afraid of them. Authority, y'all. Authority. Rise up and take authority. You know, it's like disease, sickness. Psalm 103 says, My God who heals all my diseases. How many is all? I don't know. Maybe somebody can help me answer that question. How many diseases is all diseases? Hmm. The Bible over and over again says, Fear not, only believe. Fear not. We're instructed not to have any fear at all. No sickness, no bad report, no legal threat, no threat against your family, nothing. Fear nothing.
when we get this concept of authority, we begin to realize that, how do I want to put this? The issue of fear is resolved. Now, it's resolved. Because we're in authority, we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear because everything's been put in our authority. And we have the power of the spoken word to change the situation. To reverse that thing that Satan's trying to do to us so that we can live. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, y'all. Death and life are in the power of your confession. There's only two things in this world. It either comes from God or it comes from Satan. You can't... There's no... It's not... It's, this is not Star Trek. There's no neutral zone. Alright? It only... It don't, we only have two things. And understand that fear is used for by Satan to get a foothold in your situation. You know, God moves in your behalf when you when you love and you use a sound mind. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. God uses love. And we have the mind of Christ. You know, uh, Mark 7 says that uh, in the Living Bible, it says, It is the thought life of man that pollutes him. Man, that's powerful. It is the thought life of man that pollutes him. In, or, in order for Satan to kill, steal, and destroy in your life, he, he, he has to first do it with your thoughts. You know, people wouldn't commit suicide unless the thought of suicide came in. See, it's our thought life. You know, uh, uh, one, one preacher used to, stay, used to say, Buddy, you got stinking thinking. You got to fix your thinking, your thoughts, taking thoughts into captivity. You know, in 1 Peter 5.8 it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil roams about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That word sober is really interesting. You know, what are the characteristics of sobriety? You know, if you're sober, you're awake. You're alert. You're aware. You're paying attention. You know, what are the characteristics of somebody, what's the opposite of sobriety is being drunk, all right? And that's, this is, he's kind of using this example. You know, this is, a, a, this is an analogy here. Um, the, the, the characteristics of drunkenness is, well, talk to somebody, they're, they're, they're dull. You know, they're, uh, uh, you ask them a question and maybe 10 or 15 seconds later, they answer the question because their senses are dull. You know, that's why drunk people get in car accidents so so often is because their reaction time is slower their senses are dulled their their awareness isn't there their reaction time is slow all right he's saying be sober be aware be on guard you know, this is the and this is a mind thing be aware in your mind what's going on take that thought into captivity one key of pulling down strongholds is this in Joshua 1 8 9 it says the book of the law shall not, not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, uh, and that you may observe to do all that is written in it. And he says, and then you will have good success. He says, have I not commanded you, be strong and be of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You know, uh, when, when, when God began to use me um, uh, to heal people, he showed me this really cool verse in Galatians 3, 5. And, and, and Paul, uh, he poses a question to the Galatians, and it, and it goes like this. He says, he says, Paul asked him, he says, what about God? who supplies you with the Spirit and works miracles among you. Does he do it because of your legalistic observance of the Torah commands or because you trusted in what you heard and were faithful to do it? And when I read that the first time, I didn't even see that. I didn't see it. I didn't see it like that. Because God was trying to teach me something. Let me read this again. He says, what about God who supplies you with the Spirit so what he's saying here, he says, God supplies us with the Spirit. 
and works miracles among you. So God supplies us with the Spirit and works miracles among us. And then he poses a question, did he do it because of the law or your observance of the Torah? No, he did it because you trust in what you heard and are faithful to do it. And this is the, what I saw. This is what came off the page at me, which was so cool. Adonai provides us with his spirit and performs miracles on our behalf because we believed in what we heard and are faithful to do it. And when I saw it, it was like I saw through the question and that part of it jumped out at me and the Holy Spirit said, say this. This is a promise. This is a confession. This is what you can use. So sometimes when I lay hands on people, man, I'll lay hands on them and I'll say, Adonai has provided us with his spirit and performs miracles on our behalf. Because we believed in what we heard and we are faithful to do it. Man, that's rock solid word, y'all. That's rock solid word right there. All right. Then in James 122, he says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only. So a doer of the word confirms these last three scriptures of what God is trying to teach us and to tell us about taking this authority. Being a doer of the word is what Paul is, is explaining to us when he tells us to put on the breastplate of righteousness. He describes the, the armor of God, which is not a prayer of protection. I've told you before, it's not to sit around and claim the, the armor of God or, or say it like it's a prayer you're putting on. It's a lifestyle that you walk out. And when you walk in this lifestyle, you are protected by this armor. It is there. All right? It's a lifestyle. And, and while we're all made righteous in our Father's eyes by the blood of Jesus, the breastplate of righteousness, I want you to understand, is what God showed me is, it's like those last three verses where I quoted, where we are doers of the word. All right? We are faithful to be doers of the word. When we're doing the word, it's like putting on that breastplate of righteousness. And this is how God showed me this. And this is, this is kind of where I'm going with this today. All right? I'm going to finish up here because I'm at 42 minutes. John, 1 John 5.21 says, if our, now I, I want, Before I go there, the breastplate of righteousness covers what? It's it's a it's a it's a protective covering of your chest. Well, what's in your chest? Your heart. So the breastplate of righteousness protects your heart. Okay? If if a person is in battle and they get stabbed in the heart, that's a death blow, y'all. Alright? It's like it's like the helmet of salvation. You get hit in the head, that's a death blow. That's a spiritual death. All right, one is a physical death, the other one's a spiritual death. All right, it's very important. You get, you got that sword comes down, comes crashing on your head, you're dead. But you got the helmet of salvation on. That thing bounces off the helmet. You're not spiritually dead. All right. Likewise, the breastplate of righteousness protects your heart. All right. Now listen to this. All right, one John five twenty one says, "If our heart condemns us not, what is the breastplate covering? Our heart." He's talking about our heart being condemned. If our heart condemns us not means if our heart is not condemned. Okay? My heart is not condemned. If my heart is not condemned, then there are times when my heart may be condemned. So follow me on this. this is where I'm going. We have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we believe that we receive because we keep his commandments and do. Do. Remember, doers of the word. Do those things which are pleasing in his sight. Well, what are those things? The commandments that he talked about because we keep his commandments. Do the things which are pleasing in his sight. And these are his commandments. We believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. So what is the breastplate of righteousness? It's that walk of love, y'all. It's that walk of love. When we're walking in love, we, we got that breastplate of righteousness on. And we're doers of the word. Because if I'm walking in love, you know, love conquers all. You know, if I love my wife, I'm not going to cheat on her. 
if I love my my with a with a godly love my my employer I'm not going to steal from him all right in in stealing from him may not be I'm taking things from work it may be that I'm not clocking in earlier than I should or clocking out uh, later than I should it's having an honest attitude towards my boss you know if if I walk in love I follow all Ten Commandments because they're all rolled into one. Love. Love does everything. Love doesn't lie to somebody. Love doesn't cheat somebody. Love doesn't steal. Love isn't going to gonna, you know, do the things opposed to God. The things that He's not pleased with. So when I'm walking in love, I'm a doer of the Word. I'm wearing that breastplate of righteousness. All right. I was going to give a testimony today, but I'm not going to because I'm at 45 minutes. And I, I hope this came over good. Um, I'm trying to get you to understand your authority believers, right? I'm going into the gym. I'll talk to you later. Bye. And I'm hoping that I'm going to post a couple more testimonies today. Have a good day.